Good afternoon and welcome to Broadband Breakfast Live Online for Wednesday, January 19th, uh, 2022. My name is Drew Clark. I'm editor and publisher of Broadband Breakfast and very happy to have a awesome, awesome group of uh, guests uh, who will be with us here today. Um, I just want to say we're coming up on two years of doing Broadband Breakfast Live online. We started this with the pandemic as a means of gathering people in a world where we couldn't gather otherwise. And, um, you know, we feel we've tried to do what we can to promote our motto, better broadband, better lives, which for us means getting higher capacity internet to as many people as, as need it, which is pretty much everybody, and making sure they have the tools to make use of that high capacity internet. I was driven in some ways uh, to kind of assemble that notion from my uh, prior collaboration with the late Charles Benton. Charles was uh, the, the chairman of the board of the organization I ran, the Partnership for Connected Illinois. And, and uh, Charles obviously was quite a visionary in the way he approached uh, broadband not just the infrastructure, but also connecting it to the applications and usage. And so I, I, I might have I might have kind of gotten that idea from him. And of course, I miss him. It's been five, six years coming up on six years since he he passed. I also want to thank our sponsors. Broadband Breakfast has been around for more than a decade. We've, we've kind of been in an upswing over the last three years. And, and really, a lot of that is due to of the support we have from our sponsors. So just a big shout out to Utopia Fiber, Lit Communities, uh, Broadband.Money, Broadband Now, Powerhouse Management, Samsung, Render Networks, Litbox, Positron Access, and the California Emerging Technology Fund. We would not be able to do our programs, both these programs and our in-person programs without them. So thank you to each of you. Today, uh, we're going to talk about a very exciting topic, namely community broadband network, uh, community broadband networks and its approach to infrastructure funding. Now, just before you hang up on us here, we are not gaslighting you. We did intend to do an event with state broadband leaders, and we will do that event with state broadband leaders. We just had to make a little adjustment. And so our upcoming events Next Wednesday, the 26th, will be on AI, artificial intelligence, its impact on law, media, finance, and government. The next week, Groundhog Day, we'll be talking about broadband mapping, perfect topic for that day. The next week, February 9th, we'll be discussing cryptocurrency, and that will be a broadband breakfast for lunch event. We have started doing in-person events. Here's the menu. We did it last week. We look forward to seeing you if you're in Washington in person or live online. We will still live stream it so that you can participate and enjoy it, uh, except for the food, if you are remote. And then on February 16th, four weeks from today, we will do the topic of broadband, uh, state broadband authorities and the role they are playing in implementation of IIJA. With that, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to our uh, are our four panelists. And we, again, are really excited to have them on board. Uh, all four work at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Community Broadband Network Initiatives. Uh, I've, I've known Chris Mitchell, the director here for 15 years, maybe longer, Chris. And uh, I just, you know, every every year, every month, my respect grows for what he's accomplished and continues to accomplish in this project, muninetworks.org. He is joined by um, Sean Gonsalves, who's a senior reporter, editor, and research at the project, at the initiative, uh, Rye Marcatillo McCracken, who is the senior researcher at the initiative, and uh, Deanne Cuellar. <laughs> Cuellar. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Deanne, for uh, uh, your patience with us and for uh, with me and for being a part of this discussion. Deanne is the community broadband outreach team lead, team lead. And so we are looking forward to each of you 
and uh, contributing to this discussion. Let me actually turn it to you, uh, Chris, to say just a little bit about your team here. And as you know, I want to, you know, have you give a chance to explain what the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Community Broadband Network Initiative is, because it is a lot of things, a lot of really good things. But again, what, what do you kind of crystallize what you're all about, Chris and Sean? Sure. And I'll just say that I deeply appreciated that Groundhog Day reference. Like that was well done. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, excellent and, uh, and and perfectly timed. Um, uh, I want to ask Sean to to go ahead. He's um, Sean is our communications team lead, team lead and has been doing a better job than I often do in terms of introducing our work. And so I'll just turn it over to him. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Appreciate the uh, the introduction. Great to see you, Drew. Thank you for for having us. And you said a mouthful. The Institute for Local Self Reliance Community Broadband Network Initiative. ILSR for short, for the organization wide. And just to give uh, your viewers a, a sense of the, the, the scope of the work that we do, we're, we're a national research and advocacy organization founded in 1974, mid seventies. And we work with allies across the country in an effort to build an economy that's really driven by local priorities with, with a particular focus on like reigning in the power of corporate monopolies. Um, so our organizational vision doesn't sort of really neatly fit into the conventional left-right political framework um, as we work to build local power. But over the years, ILSR has established uh, a number of specific initiatives, five to be exact as of today. So we've got an energy democracy initiative, independent business initiative, which is fabulous. All of them are actually fabulous. Our waste to wealth program. We also have a composting for community initiative. And then, of course, I'm here with Chris and two of my other colleagues from the uh, Community Broadband Networks Initiative. And as you pointed out, we, we do a, a, a lot of things. We, we, we analyze and document the, the birth and development of community broadband networks across the country. Uh, you know, we advocate for locally rooted, democratically accountable broadband networks. We publish daily stories on our website, uh, muninetworks.org. Our, our program director, Chris, some, some of your viewers may be familiar with the weekly podcast, Community Broadband Bits. And then we also have a live uh, YouTube show uh, once a week called Connect This. Is that right? Am I getting yes, that right? Precisely. You have, you have to say it a certain way for it to, for it to hit. Which gives um, and, you a sense of how serious it is. It's, uh... <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> serious stuff. Um, and then we also publish reports and write policy briefs and, 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 and things of that nature. We... We're also, um, we support community organizing efforts, which, which Deanne can speak to. And we also conduct um, some important research as it relates to broadband and broadband access and, and, and how it impacts lives, uh, particularly in the areas of tribal connectivity and in telehealth. And, and that's something that Rai is the tip of the spear on that front. And he, you know, he, can, he can speak to that. So, so there's a lot going on at what you know, we call this, you know, this, this, moment or what I call this, this watershed moment in the broadbandification of America with all of this unprecedented federal uh, investments being made in, in, in broadband uh, expansion efforts and so forth. So we don't just do muni broadband, we do kind of like a lot of things over here. So thank, thank you for the opportunity to set the table that way. What, what are some of the greatest hits that uh, the, the, the Community Broadband Network Initiative has had? I mean, either in terms of stories that you've published over the last five, 10 years, or just in terms of changing the groundwork for, for disc, discourse. Chris, go for it. Yeah, sure. I'll jump in and take that. I mean, the thing that really put us on the map was the map. And uh, that was the first time that people had a chance to see how many community networks there were across the nation. Uh, we started tracking that and uh, we published it with the help of the Ford Foundation. Uh, most of our work is, um, has been funded by foundations, um, some individual donors here and there. Um, and we basically were tracking where all the community networks were and then trying to give people a sense of what's going on with them. So we do a lot of stories about them. Um, one of the things that I think 
gave us uh, more pr of a prominent role recently was that after Ardoff finished, uh, we rapidly went from uh, having been big supporters of that reverse auction approach and thinking it was going to work very well to recognizing that it um, the, the problems with the rules that we had thought wouldn't be as much of an issue were. And so then we did what I think we're fairly well known for, which is taking something that's fairly complicated and trying to and trying to explain it to people who aren't spending 24 seven in the broadband ecosphere, especially uh, in the kind of like federal agency broadband ecosphere. Um, and so we did that. And then more recently, we just did an explainer on the um, Slurfer, the uh, state, local, uh, state and local fiscal recovery fund, which which uh, has really good news, which we'll talk about here. And we just try to explain that to folks. And then knowing that local leaders are going to maybe read an explanation and then two months later have a city council member or a city attorney or someone else say, wait, how, how do you know we can do this with this money? Um, we try to document that and, and, and explain exactly where those uh, rules come in so people could just bookmark that and then be able to find it very easily. Um, so those are some of the things that we do. And then we, um, you know, we have a variety of GIS work where we're trying to track um, uh, the municipal networks and the cooperative approaches in different ways and get a sense of, of uh, how many people only have an option from one of the big cable or telephone monopolies uh, versus um, other options. Um, and I would say that one of the things you'll see from us more now with Deanne's work is that we're going to be trying to help local groups be uh, more effective. Um, and and I, our sense is not that we're going to be going in and organizing local groups and, and running campaigns so much as we are going to be making sure that the sort of the knowledge that's out there uh, in the broadband space among advocates around the country is available to people that are organizing, whether that's in Seattle or Los Angeles or rural Minnesota. Um, you know, wherever they are, we want to try to make sure everyone's connected to that, so no one feels like they have to spend, you know, two weeks trying to learn something that someone else could explain to them pretty easily. So I guess that's those are kind of our the big hits that I think of, but I don't know if anyone else has anything that comes to mind. Well, th those are those are a lot, right? And and I think that that the way you phrase this, Chris, about making sure that these all too often arcane debates that you referenced art off, you know, you you re referenced the the slurfer. Uh, I guess we're going to have to figure out how Slurf to pronounce earth. it. Slurf earth, slurf earth, the slurf earth program, right? I mean, making sure that the knowledge about them is is not just bureaucratic speak, but is available to people, right? And, and we definitely share that in terms of Broadband Breakfast always wants to make sure we write in a way that brings people into the debate rather than blocks them out the way so many telecom lobbyists want this world to be. We're, we're going to talk more sort of just now about IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that passed uh, last November uh, 6th, I believe, and it was signed by President Biden on November 15th. And, and the rulemaking process has begun on that. Uh, I, I do want to mention we at Broadband Breakfast are very involved with one of our partners and sponsors, Broadband.Money, in putting together uh, a, a resource guide specifically on IIJA. And we've, we've done a lot and are having a kind of a crowdsourced any comments you want to make about uh, the IIJ rules this Friday, two days from now, I'll put the link into the chat window, uh, as well as the panelist resources later on. But those those rules are coming, uh, you know, the due date to reply to them is coming up on February 4th. So people need to be thinking about that. And we, like I said, we want to talk a bit about that here in this discussion. But first, let's hear from Rye and Deanne about some of the areas at ILSR that you are involved in and some of the ways that, you know, you you kind of uh, help uh, the people who come to you or or, or in, engage in, in advocacy on these important issues. Um, Rai, let's, let's hear from you. Sure. Uh, hi, Drew. Thanks for inviting us. My name is Rai Marcatilio McCracken. I'm a senior researcher and the research team lead on the Community Broadband Networks Initiative at ILSR. I manage parts of our clearinghouse of writing and news, unionnetworks.org, uh, where I also write about legislation and policy and tell the stories of communities who are addressing connectivity challenges across the country. 
Uh, I run the long-term research projects team on the broadband side of ILSR, which includes two wonderful researchers and a postdoctoral fellow who wrangle data of all types and do a bunch of wonderful writing. Um, the team heads up our big new reports and report refreshes that do things like profile the broadband landscape uh, in states all around the country, uh, document the cost savings uh, that can come from um, telehealth initiatives over a robust broadband infrastructure and uh, profile the monopoly ISP landscape uh, and all sorts of things. So uh, it's wonderful to be here for this conversation. Deanne, it's great to uh, meet you and learn more about the, the role you play as community broadband outreach team lead. Tell, will you tell us a little more about the role you play at uh, ILSR? Sure, and thank you so much uh, for having me as well. Um, I am still uh, new to uh, this team over at ILSR, but I have been doing this work um, on digital inclusion and, and tech equity as I describe it for over a decade. And I would also say that in this role, I'm bringing um, you know, all the experiences that I've learned working on this issue at the state, um, at the local state and federal level, but being, being a part of this team, um, I would say that also that I'm at the right place at the right time in history uh, that to work on solutions that will result um, in actually closing the digital divide um, in our lifetime. And um, I'm working with someone um, named Dosman Lee as well uh, across geographies. We have a huge focus on the West Coast right now in Los Angeles and LA County. And, um, you, you know, community outreach like Chris said is not going into, not parachuting into local communities and, and doing the work, but more in our capacity, it's about advancing the research that we do um, at our organization, advancing the research that's being done within local communities, you know, and binding them together so that um, the groups on the ground have capacity to advance, you know, their solutions and their programs. Also engaging deep networks and by supporting the partners that already exist. And I think we also do that in two or three ways. One is you'll hear this comment like we, you know, we're building trust and we're working at the speed of trust, you know, across geographies and regions. We're also building consensus, pulling partners together that might not know about each other that have um, the same goals in mind for bridging the digital divide. And by also at, sometimes identifying stakeholder groups uh, that um, are not yet at the table that should be just because digital inclusion or bridging the digital divide is also one of their main issues. Deanne, what is your reaction to the role that digital equity and digital inclusion plays in um, broadband infrastructure debates, right? How, how is the digital equity and digital outreach concerns sort of most uh, manifested or needs to be manifested in our discussions about broadband infrastructure? Hmm. I mean, that's a that's a, like a like a long, a complicated question, and I invite people on my team to also chime in here. But I, you know, right now, one of the first times in our lifetime, we're not just talking about doing equity work, equity, do, you know, bridging the divides, bringing communities together, working on equity, regardless of what sector, health equity, racial equity, tech equity, these are issues that we have known about for decades, but because of different movements and different base building that has been advanced, um, not with just technology, but like organ um, our groups and communities, whether it's rural or urban have come together to work on these issues. We're seeing uh, the table get bigger and we're seeing more people come to that table who wanna work on these um, issues. So I, uh, the other thing I would say also is that, uh, you know, for decades, the community, communities in rural areas of the country and communities that are urban based have always pointed to these problems. And, uh, you know, you alluded to a joke earlier about mapping for Groundhog Day. I thought that that was brilliant because, you know, the mapping issue doesn't seem to go away, although communities without maps could point to an issue and tell you what's wrong. You know, one thing I would I would add, um, you, you you asked about the relationship between you know digital equity and this conversation that we're having about broadband infrastructure, and it kind of ties in obviously to the IIJA, um, which is that you know networks uh, need to be deployed in areas where 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 it's needed most, and and in a lot of those areas, not just in rural America, but in but in urban and suburban America, uh, there's a there's a need for network deployment. 
uh, for folks who are, you know, who are unserved in those areas. And, 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 and it's not just a question of, is there theoretical access to that kind of connectivity, you know, through various providers, but is it affordable? And so the IIA, the IIJA, the infrastructure bill, I'll just say, um, makes an unprecedented attempt to address some of those issues. Now we can kind of argue about the particulars and whether or not certain components of it will be as effective as other things, but, but certainly there's, there's, there's a lot of money in there for uh, deployment. And there's some Easter eggs in the infrastructure bill as it relates to digital equity. I mean, there's an unprecedented amount of money for digital inclusion initiatives, but there's also, again, some Easter eggs in there in terms of connecting folks who have been caught on the wrong side of the digital divide. Let's actually talk a little bit about that, Sean, and and, and everyone. I, I can kind of move into our discussion of IIJA. What we said we'd talk about here is issues, trends, and concerns on the minds of community broadband networks with a particular emphasis on open questions about the IIJ. So, so let's start with the good first. What are those Easter eggs? And, and I know I know you've written a great piece on this way back in August when the Senate passed, you know, you know, Muni Networks was right on top of, 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 of covering this and, and we've, we've been there too. But, but tell us a little bit, Sean, about what are some of those really good things in IIJA? Well, first of all, we should just back up a little bit, probably just to, you know, say that, you know, this, so even prior to that uh, piece that I had written when the, uh, the Senate passed, passed, I'd written about this thing called the Accessible Affordable Internet for All Act. That was a, at that time, we all on our team thought it was a pipe dream. It was a proposal to invest $100 billion, And we ended up with the uh, infrastructure bill of $65 billion, dollars. Um, $42 billion of that goes to the, what they call the BEAD program, um, which is the grant money being given to the states. That's actually one of the things that we think is pretty good about this particular bill, as Chris alluded to earlier. The RDOF uh, mess, I should say, you know, has turned into just that, as, as, as Chris aptly pointed out and some things that he's written about and, and thought about. And so from our perspective, the, the, the closer decision making is made to local communities, the better. And not just for some like ideological reason, but because the, the, the FCC maps are so inaccurate and because uh, we don't have very precise data, the best places that, that, that have the best sense of where connectivity challenges are, are in local communities. And so we thought that in the infrastructure bill, the fact that they didn't decide to sort of do another art, art off and, and decided to give this money to the states to, to, to dispense the grant money, you know, you're, it was, is a better move and it. And you're getting closer to, you know, where the actual source of, of, you know, some of the challenges are. So I would say that that's, that's one good thing, but, you know, of course, in that, um, you know, I call it kind of the laboratories of broadbandification, where it's like each state can kind of do their own thing. So, you know, within certain limits. So, you know, I think one and also another good thing is that even though the NTIA, who's putting together the rules on how, how this money should be spent, even though they're forbidden from doing any kind of price regulation, grant recipients do have to provide at least one low cost broadband option for eligible households. And as, as, as a lot of folks in this space like to say, and as I say all the time, if it's not affordable, it's not accessible. So that's that's an important uh, piece of 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 this uh, bill. Um, you know, I think you know some states are going to use the money wisely. Some states are probably going to bungle it, hand it over to the the, the big incumbents. But there's real money uh, in this bill for the first time for being invested in digital inclusion. And um, and uh, you know, I, while the bulk of the money will go towards Adjust, addressing the digital divide in rural America, there's some good stuff in there even that cities can take advantage of. One, one particular section in, 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 the, in the bead part of the bill says that grant money can be used to bring broadband to multifamily buildings with a priority given to affordable housing complexes. So that, that, that's an important good thing that, that, that's in there. Um, so, you know, I'll let other folks kind of jump in, but those are just some of the, the, the things that come to the top of mind when, we, when we're talking about the infrastructure bill and, and some of the good things in it. Who yeah, else? I'm, 
I'd be curious if Deanne, if you would uh, reflect, um, you know, you have more experience in terms of working on the ground with local officials than than I do, um, because you were actually doing it in San Antonio for so long. And I'm, I'm curious how you think um, this will impact based on that view. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Chris. One of the things that um, I can't stop thinking about having this discussion is uh, but was meeting with local leaders recently and someone used this phrase about this opportunity, this watershed opportunity of funding that's coming into our local communities. And the leader said, uh, I wanna work on closing digital divide that moves our communities from being elegant, cons elegant customers to critical content creators. And I loved that phrase because it, for me, I think that's what we're going to see is that lots of, lots of products and solutions and lots of federal funding that's been pumped into our local communities for decades has largely focused on making us elegant consumers that accept the product that was not community designs. And those products have been unaffordable, unattainable, and in some, um, in some areas of our communities, um, unavailable completely. And here we have, um, you know, although it's, you know, it's really hard to decipher if you're looking at all of the different federal funding opportunities as a local community, what is for me at the center is giving the local communities and local leaders an opportunity to actually create solutions for their communities that are gonna be longstanding over a lifetime and seeing not just uh, connectivity and the largest internet service providers um, on the front lines of a lot of these solutions is also a, a great moment in our inner history to actually see it, bring it back and opening it up to all three legs of the stool as we call it. Um, and seeing how those solutions intersect with each other uh, to really meet uh, the community's needs. So thank you. Go, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, and I, one other thing that I would say about this is that like, I feel like I was really influenced by something I think it influenced a lot of people because there's this brilliant thinking about infinite games versus finite games. And uh, the idea is basically like, you know, we can think of this as like the IIJA is something that's like it's of, of itself, right? And when the money's spent, it's all gone. And like, what happens next? And we, we expect that this IIJA money will solve a lot of the problems in a lot of the states. Some states, it may solve almost all of their rural broadband problems um, if it's spent well. In other places, uh, it won't be spent effectively. And I don't, I don't just mean that it may go to entities that um, I you know, don't think are the highest, best use of the money. I mean, in some cases, money might be spent fraudulently, where it's not just that people get a service that I think is inferior, they might get nothing, um, you know, if states aren't prepared to vet these, um, uh, some of the proposals and whatnot. And so that's a, a definite issue of concern. But it doesn't end there. I mean, what happens next is hopefully people will be held responsible for whether they've made good investments or not. And that's the really great part of this. One of the, the things that's incredibly frustrating about RDOF is that no one will be held to account for, um, I don't know, months, years of wasted time, uh, potentially billions of wasted dollars, um, you know, depending on, on how it unfolds. Uh, certainly no one was held to account for the failures of the Connect America Fund program, which was just, um, which is a, just a total disaster. When you look at, I mean, we're working in Mississippi, AT&T got like $280 million and, you know, drive around Mississippi and try to find people that are really happy with their AT&T service. That's, that's an incredible amount of money. No one's held to account for that. When this money, the in some of the states that gets misspent, I think people will be upset with governors. I think they'll be upset, you know, even despite the the kind of political, um, um, what's it called, the um, the polarity that we have. The, right. um, um, and so anyway, like I think one of the things that's exciting about this is that it's not just a matter of when this money's gone. Hopefully, we'll have learned, and I and I do think we will learn from this process, both good and bad lessons. Well, Chris, I I can't help coming into this question of maybe the mind bending politics of local governance versus federal or national governance, right? And so you've talked about the, you know, the art off model and the problems you identified. And here we're talking about states funneling the money to the states. I mean, kind of the block grant idea of the federal government giving money to the states and then letting the states decide, that's almost been a more kind of a conservative talking point. But you guys seem to be endorsing that wholeheartedly. And I just wonder like, 
uh, I mean, is, is, are there any reservations that, besides the fact that some states are going to screw it up because of bad state management, right? But what, what is your general thought about the states versus the federal government? BTOP, of course, the Broadband Technology Opportunities Program of the Obama administration did not have this kind of funnel money to the states. It went primarily through the federal government. So interested in any of your thoughts on that, the state component that is quite prominent in IIJA. Yes, and this is where Sean set us up perfectly at the beginning by noting that we don't easily fit within political buckets. Um, we do think decisions should be made locally, and it's not because people always do everything right at the local level. Uh, it's because we believe that in an open society, people should have to take some responsibility. And that means having to, the power to make decisions. It means being responsible when you make the wrong decision um, to correct it. Um, and so I think this is something that we are seeing as a larger trend. Um, I think we've kind of peaked at the centralization, both in, um, in business and in government, and, um, and part due to the decentralizing um, potential of the internet and um, decentralized energy and other things. I think we're seeing, a, this is sort of like, you know, political philosopher, Chris, um, <laughs> you know, um, we're seeing a movement away from centralization in some ways. And, um, and so this is a, a part of that theme. And we're going to have to learn to adjust just. It means that our state governments will have to do better. Um, you know, they will have to take more responsibility. And rather than just talking about things, they will actually have money and authority to act. So I think this is a good trend. I don't think it's going to solve all the problems. But I'm deeply worried about um, the FCC. Um, you know, the fact that it's it has not taken broadband seriously in terms of figuring out where it is with the mapping. Um, you know, it, it messed up on RDOF significantly. And I think the people who did it want to instead pretend that they got it great rather than admitting that they made some serious errors. And, and so I don't think we can trust them to distribute this much money. And it's smarter to say, you know, we'd rather see 25 success stories and 25 failures, then taking a 2% chance will have 100% success and a 98% chance will have 100% failure, um, which is a dramatic uh, overreading of it. But that's, um, you know, I think the concern and why to break it up, uh, yeah. because we are going to have to learn from it over time. Uh, yep. And I, I, you know, I would just add that, you know, you know, as with all things, there's, there's nuances. I mean, so, you know, in an ideal world, I think we would have much rather preferred to see this bill reflect what Biden, what President Biden kind of laid out, which was to prioritize municipal networks, nonprofits and co-ops, because we think that, you know, that's, you know, um, that that's the best approach to, to really getting at the core of the connectivity challenges of local communities. But of course, in the sausage making, that is DC politics, you know, this is better than RDOF. And so there's that, but there's also some potential issues, I think, with the states, which is that there's a few, and I'll just tick them off real quick. First of all, you have to, if you're a state, you have to submit a five-year plan that lays out how you're going to use that money. And there's going to be a number of states, maybe even a lot of states that, well, first of all, there's, there's a lot of states that have only recently established broadband offices. So there's that issue. The grant writing process is not easy. And the paperwork involved is going to be huge. Which, 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 and there's another issue, too, is that, that in, in a, a number of these offices, people are leaving these offices for more lucrative in, industry jobs. So there's a, there's a question about, uh, you know, sort of staffing levels. And then, and then when you think about how in this bill, it does say that, you know, you can't exclude municipal networks or co-ops co or nonprofits from, from applying for this grant money, but there's 17 states still in 2022 that have preemption laws that make it either impossible or very difficult uh, for municipalities to build or own or operate networks. And so it's an open question as to what's going to happen in those states. And, well, and is, then, is it an open, is it an open question? I mean, let, let's, let's tease yeah. that just a little bit more. <laughs> No, I, I I would love you know for you to do a show with lawyers to explain. It. I'm gonna I am speaking with some folks today that that have you know legal training in this to try to understand what happens. But one of the things I'm afraid of is, for instance, in North Carolina, the state might say, "All right, well, we can't stop the munis from applying, but if you win, you can't spend the money." And like, does that fit with? under the federal, it'll depend on how NTIA writes the rules. And now how is NTIA going to write the rules? Do you think the Biden administration wants to pull back a billion dollars from North Carolina in an election year? <laughs> like, I don't. Well, and, well, so we, and so I mean, anyway, but um, I, I also want to, I want to point out um, um, one other thing, which is that I think even if this money is well spent, um, you know, overwhelmingly, 
there will be some cases of fraud or, or just mistakes that were made. And I think it's important that we understand um, what the stakes are because we cannot design a perfect way of distributing $42 billion. Um, whether that is um, you know, public-private partnerships, whether it's entirely on municipal and cooperative projects, which I think have a different level of accountability that's more significant, um, there is gonna be some money that is misspent. But I think what to understand is this amount of money will move us forward to get more people internet access such that if in my state of Minnesota, let's say we distribute a billion dollars and 300 million of, of it is spent in not wise ways, that $700 million will so accelerate economic growth and opportunity and quality of life that it will create billions of dollars of value for the economy over my lifetime and will have been a wise expenditure even if not all of it is spent correctly. And I would just come back to say that, you know, when it comes to, um, oh, so, um, 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 it's almost there, but it's um, the company that did the, uh, the solar panels um, during the, the ARA um, that went bankrupt and we, it was a hundred billion, it was like um, a few hundred million dollars. Polaris, something, something like that. that. Yeah, whatever that was, um, you know, that was the same program that put money into Tesla. And our economy, I think, is benefiting from the innovation and the way in which that company has pushed multiple markets forward, such that it was a really great bet, even though we made two bets, one of them paid off amazingly and the other one right. we lost. Right. Like, if I got that in Vegas, my wife would be so happy. <laughs> <laughs> the questions are beginning to pour in, which is which sure. is awesome. Uh, and, and I wanna get to them. Uh, let's start with Steve Georgi, being a resident of Minnesota, can't thank you enough for your assessment of the Ardoff disaster. He says LTD broadband was awarded nearly $1 billion, but has no proven track record uh, and has paralyzed our state from moving towards with rural broadband installation. And then he says that at this time, our state office for broadband did not take applications for state funded grants for broadband projects in 2022. You, got, you guys are in Minnesota, or at least some of you are. Uh, tell us your thoughts on Minnesota kind of from the ground up with regard to Steve's question here. Yeah, I'll, I'll just take this because I want to be I want to be careful about it. I um I don't want to say anything that um, um might be um, grounds for any kind of legal action because I feel like um, LTD is backed into a corner in some ways. And um, you know I think LTD won what 1.3 billion dollars across the country. Uh, they're a company that has a history of operating um, fixed wireless services in parts of Minnesota. Uh, I would say that when we looked into their customer satisfaction, it didn't seem like it was um, as high as one might like to see if it's going to be the single fastest growing broadband provider in the history of the nation um, to be able to build $1.3 billion worth of federal grants, which is probably like five or $6 billion worth of infrastructure. Um, so um, I think this is an example in which the FCC moving slow has paralyzed the state because there are really great local private companies that had good projects in that would have already been finished being built today or you know perhaps in the summer in, in, in another case um, that got pulled back while the state decides whether or not it believes that LTD is going to get this money and move forward with building its network. Um, let, and that's incredibly frustrating. Let me just make two points. One is that on, on behalf of, so to speak, oh, uh, Steve, we got we to move on to other questions. So I, thank you though for your question. Um, on the LTD, even though they are primarily fixed wireless, uh, did in its RDOF application say it was going to do fiber in almost all of its places. So I just want to make that point. And the second one is there's there's kind of, I think it's misinformation. I think it's incorrect information saying that RDOF grants are going to like be ineligible for IIJA, but I reviewed IIJA and I see nothing that would bar an area that's received an RDOF award from re receiving. Now, again, it's good. in some ways, a lot of decision-making is going to go to the states. So some states may say RDOF is not a bar and other states may say RDOF is a bar and IIJA basically lets them make that decision. What are some of your thoughts about that particular last question I raised? Yeah, let me, let me just take that as well. Well, um, because this is sort of this is one of the areas in which I continue to be the main person doing it on my team. Um, Wisconsin has a really interesting proposal in that, um, uh, as I understand it, um, the way they've handled it and the way that they are, um, uh, there's some language that is going into their revised broadband subsidy approach. Um, if 
an RDOF award is going to build in the next two years, then it might be considered ineligible. Um, but if, um, if a provider in an RDOF territory is not going to start building within two years, then that area may be eligible for state grants. Uh, that to me seems like a pretty decent balance. I would have to go back over the language to remind myself because all these different programs are confusing, but I agree with you that it will be up to states to decide on this. But I just, I mean, there is something extremely peculiar about some of the big award winners in the, um, in RDOF, in that if charter communications, if charter spectrum, um, you know, a big national cable company, if they're planning to build parts of, let's say, North Carolina anyway, then they're going to, they're going to be willing to take, you know, cents on the dollar, and they can do that um, for um, for an award area. But when smaller companies are taking cents on the dollar to build in massive new areas where they're effectively going beyond the size of anything they've ever done before, well, if they can build to these massive areas where they're effectively paying thirty five hundred, four thousand dollars per home passed, if they can do that profitably, they can build out ninety percent of America without a subsidy. And if they could do that, I feel like we would see evidence of it. Like, <laughs> and so like, I just like, I hope that the FCC and some of these, many of these that I'm speaking to where there's a very low percentage of the reserve price that was hit, the FCC has not released those funds. And I think, and I hope they're being extremely careful in vetting those proposals because yeah. there's just like, I mean, I cannot believe that you can deliver gigabit services to homes by like, you know, um, in areas where it's going to cost you an average cost of multiple thousands of dollars per home without any kind of a, of an explanation why. Right. Let's let's keep moving into questions. I want to get back to Slurfer, but but let's take Paul Garnett's question and ask Deanne first. Just wonder if the panelists could share thoughts on how they would define affordability. Actually, Deanne and Rye, we'd like to hear from you too here. Uh, what uh, and Paul Garnett asks. Also wondering if if they have thoughts on what happens when the affordable connectivity funding runs out, likely in three four years. So Deanne, Rye, and anyone else then. Sure. I have actually like a quick three part answer to this question and it sort of pivots a little bit back to the, the question about whether or not the government should be involved or, or not. And, you know, the, the internet is not a want, it's a need, it's a utility, it's not a luxury. The government works for all of us, not some of us. And I say that because we collectively as a country at the local level, state level and federal level have a collective responsibility to get this done. It's an infrastructure project that, you know, has gone on indefinitely and it should not. And I'm pointing that out because there was like, you know, well, the telephone, you know, telephone lines was like a, a, a certain point in history. Sure. Um, so like if we're in a certain point in history, then like, let's, let's get it done. And as uh, that relates to, you know, affordability, you know, that, you know, th that question is, is always, you know, difficult to answer within context, just because you, you get into the weeds nobody wants to get into the weeds about like unserved and underserved communities. And at the end of the day, you know, what is, what is affordable to an older adult, you know, that's socially isolated and what is affordable to um, a single parent raising more than one child in public school is different. So at the end of the day, what we have to work on is affordable high-speed internet access, free or affordable. And that's why involvement of local communities is critical. And how that, the last part of that um, answer for me, the third part is, you know, we were talking about whether or not states are gonna get it done or not. You know, I live in a state of Texas where you have to work across party lines, form consensus and work in coalition to get it done because that's the kind of state that I live in. And I trust that local communities who have historically in my city of San Antonio have advocated at the state level to pull resources done and get it done. It's gonna happen um, across our state. And I'm, I'm also pleased that like the proximity to the solution is gonna be at the state level and not the federal level. So we can uh, speed that up. As it relates to, you know, the affordable program that you know, has changed names fund, a, yeah yeah that, that that has changed names a couple of times um you know i don't know if it's going to run out in three to four years because i you know uh I, don't, I think it's really difficult to take away something um from the community once you've created it so if you want to take it away if you want it to be done then we're going to have to like tackle these issues head on to where there's no need for the program to exist um rye what are some of your thoughts about these questions about um affordability Sure. Yeah, I think Deanne um, hit all those points uh, very well. I think picking a picking a number um, 
for what is you know a monthly rate that is affordable for baseline internet access uh, is very difficult. The $30 per month benefit uh, in the ACP is certainly going to uh, help a bunch of uh, a bunch of families all over the country. Um, I live here in southern Minnesota, and uh, and my bill is $95 a month for my internet access. And so $30 off of that brings it down to 65, which is you know I think many would uh, argue is still you know. Uh, well, well outside the reach of, of uh, especially low income households across the country. And so it remains to be seen uh, to what extent states are going to use some of the digital inclusion money in the infrastructure bill to maybe supplement that and throw another 15 or $30 on top of it. Um, but I can say that, you know, uh, in parts of the country where there are, uh, where there's broadband competition in parts of the country where there are locally rooted networks like municipalities, like electric and telephone cooperatives that uh, are already offering you know, quality connections at relatively affordable prices, that $30 a month is going to make a huge difference. Let's, let's get to slurf, uh of the Treasury Capital Fund. Uh, Chris, could you give us a quick summary of the problem, <laughs> your sure. reaction, and the kind of thing that happened last week? Yeah, so this is... Um... In the rescue plan, there was $350 billion that was distributed to states and localities. Uh, these are direct payments um, over two years. One has already been made in the um, uh, spring of, of 2021, and then in another few months, the rest of the money will be distributed. Um, this money has multiple authorized uses, one of which is broadband infrastructure. The Treasury Department was this was tasked with writing the rules over how local governments could spend it. Because you can imagine if a local government was like, eh, we're going to build a satellite and we're going to send it to Earth and that's how we're going to deliver broadband. I think Treasury would say, well, that's that's not actually an acceptable ex broadband expense you know, for you. It's kind of impractical for you to do that. So um, there's guidelines around how to do it. And when the guidelines came out last year, we felt that they were unnecessarily tight and they were not actually, um, they were tighter than what was required by statute. And that was a problem because cities, and I always use the example of Baltimore, um, um, cities like Baltimore more or less have 100% cable coverage, you know, plus or minus. And the challenge is that in some neighborhoods, you might only have 5, 10, 15% of people on the internet. So when the schools shut down, even though anyone in Baltimore can get service from Comcast, um, more or less, the half of the kids more or less don't have internet access in the home. So obviously there's a problem. And that problem is not well defined by whether or not 25 megabits down and three megabit service is available. Even though Comcast not only has that available for people who can pay for it, they have the Internet Essentials program to help subsidize it, which has a variety of hoops that one has to jump through. Obviously, it wasn't getting the job done in the way that we needed to to solve this problem. But the Treasury rules basically would have said there's no problem in Baltimore. Comcast has it covered. And, um, and there's a kind of an escape hatch in that um, one could say, well, the service isn't reliable by these metrics, and so therefore we're still able to spend the money on broadband here. They got rid of all of that issue that we were complaining about. And by we, I, I mean like the cities of America, as well as the number of nonprofit organizations that work on this issue. Um, and, and now it's more or less a situation in which cities can document the need that they have to, res that they have to fix. And that may be an affordability crisis. Uh, it might be a reliability issue. Um, it might be that, that the network simply doesn't provide the service that it claims that it does in certain areas. And if cities document that, then they are able to spend some of their American Rescue Plan dollars on uh, resolving that issue. And if they do that, for instance, in a neighborhood where you might have like 100 homes and 43 of them have this major problem, you could build out to that, 100 that entire neighborhood and serve everyone based on, um, on that. So we feel that like, I mean, just to sort of bring this back around to earlier, once again, the federal government has said, and I think correctly in this case, um, and, and I'm going to just finish that off in a second, but the, it says basically we're going to trust local authority on this matter. And I think that's the only rational decision one can make here because the federal government does not have accurate data. Like no one in the federal government can tell you where broadband really is affordable and accessible in Baltimore and where it's not. 
right? Like this has been a, a catastrophic failure of the Federal Communications Commission that may or may not be resolved by this administration. If it does, it's probably gonna take it its entire term. Um, and so in a, in a situation where there is no data set, the only reasonable thing is to allow local governments to make a case with the available data that they can collect. Right, and it's, it, you know, it's, it's those local communities. I mean, if you're a local elected official, or a school district official and all of a sudden overnight you have thousands of kids who don't have who can't do distance learning and you had to deploy community you know hotspots you know th those are indicators of of where problems lie that 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 simply don't register at, at a certain level um and you're, you know if you're a business in the community and you have some serious reliability issues the folks that they're turning to and speaking to about that are the local officials, and they have a much better sense of where in particular in the community these kind of connectivity challenges lie. And Drew, let me, let me, just, let me just say this, because I feel like you should ask me, you know, like, aren't we afraid that some cities are going to go crazy and spend all of their money building a new so, Cadillac? Yeah, I was exactly going to ask areas. you, like, what will we see? How many cities will take us up? We do have a question. I kind of wanted to weave in here that Mark, uh, uh, I'll, I'll get it right here, is, is raising here about, um, you know, uh, how, um, how uh, you know, should government be in the business, right? I mean, I see this argument. We see this argument all the time. Why, why what are the problems with that argument, um, Chris and, 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 and others, that you are seeing with this, pro with, with like, government shouldn't, municipalities shouldn't be in the business of, of, of ISPs. Yes. I think there's two different issues in, in that. One is, is I think a theoretical issue of like, are there concerns with a government having control over communications infrastructure? And I think any history of the United States, of, of any of the, of the world is what I was actually meaning to say, suggests that yes, we should have concerns and we should have safeguards because communications are essential and despotic governments can arise at different times. And if they have access to control over communications, bad things will happen. Now, in this case, I feel like we have to balance that potential threat against a very real reality that the marketplace is not working. And in some places, it will um, be correctable with partnerships and things like that. In some places, local government making direct investments and ideally, from my point of view, being one of multiple options to be an information conduit makes a lot of sense. Um, I think we should be deeply worried about places, um, whether uh, it would be a, a state, a federal or a local entity being the only source of communications. But I think this is more an issue of whether or not it is a last resort in some cases. Um, and so that's that's one issue. And I think the other issue is whether we will see local governments deciding to take this money and try to build profitable networks that will become a profit center for the city in generating revenue. And I, I think if that happens, it'll be one or two times. Um, I, I think it'll be a terrible decision, but I, I don't think we're gonna see very much of that because local leaders, I think are pretty accountable to their elect, to their constituents and constituents don't wanna see this one-time infusion of money that can fix critical infrastructure be wasted on something that's just gonna benefit, you know, the, the wealthiest areas of town. Well, Bob, Bob Jacobson raises this point about telecom has always been a muni function in Scandinavia. And, and I'm just going to throw in something that Chris and I have talked about for, for years, which is that, well, again, every city is different. Every community has different needs. And that's why we need to have flexibility. But there are some real advantages to breaking this telecom vertical monopoly apart. And this is where open access networks come in, because oftentimes it makes so much sense for the municipality to have some kind of role in the rights of way, even the ownership of the dark dark fiber or the conduit and to have another entity as an open op open access operator and have still others offering services on that network. Sean, I don't know if you were going to jump in on that point there. Well, no, I was just going to bring that up. I mean, that's the, that's the, 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 what's so attractive about open access networks is, is it sort of separates out this, the, the infrastructure piece from the service. And, um, you know, and then, and in that regard, then it becomes a question of, you know, you know, not many people make the case that, you know, government shouldn't be in the build business of building roads, um, uh, you know, and that kind of essential infrastructure that's necessary for economic development, for commerce and, and, and all of that. And um, so anyway, you, you made that point well, but, I, but I'm glad that you did. You know, I would, I would say that, I mean, to argue against, um, you know, the position in the most timid way that I, I might, um, is that I, I absolutely think open access resolves a lot of these challenges. I do not think it is 
perfect in the sense that I, in my ideal world, we would have multiple overlapping infrastructures and at least one of those would be open and, and directly accountable to the public, whether through some kind of local uh, cooperative arrangement or um, some kind of public ownership. And the reason for that is just that I think the history and, and you know, in other states, other countries that have had publicly owned, uh, even open access systems, uh, if it's the only game in town, the people running it inevitably start to get lazy or, or shift investments for upgrades and things like that. And so, you know, my, my point of view is that I think that we should have um, open access, but that we should also encourage a duplicative infrastructure. And some will say that's inefficient and a waste of money, but I think over a long period of time, it will result in the correct amount of investment to make sure that we're, we're seeing upgrades when we need them and that sort of a thing. I'm glad you said du duplicative, Chris, because I'm, I'm, I get so frustrated hearing the word overbuilding when people hijack an engineering term for what we're talking about, which is essentially an economic issue, because overbuilding that engineering term in reality means competition. And that's part of what we're trying to address here. So whether it's through open access networks or munis and co-ops being a part of the mix, the, the, one of the fundamental problems that we're dealing with in terms of affordability and, and, and the quality of service is the fact that if you're a monopoly provider, there's not any incentive for you to do better. And so part of this is about creating the conditions to bring competition into the market, which is good. People that are opposed to this call that overbuilding, nor I think regular folks call that competition. Yeah, no, it sounds like I'm really hearing loud and clear competition is key. It's key to what you're about, what, what um, local, the role, or even just the, th the theoretical potential of a locality getting involved is, is to be able to offer competition. I, I wanna give everyone a chance to weigh in on best and worst case of IIJA, but let's just close out this point about the SLURFRF and how it fits in or could fit in to IIJA. How do these uh, um, ARPA, right? The American Recovery Plan Act funds potentially interact. And again, we're going to have a big discussion about this uh, on broadband.money on Friday. I put the link for that event in the chat window early on Friday at 2.30 in the afternoon, what IIJ rules should be. But Chris and whoever else, please close out this thought and then we'll hear from everyone to finish up. Yes, I would just say quickly that slurf, erf, erf, <laughs> slurf, erf, um, rule money um, can be a match for the infrastructure dollars. So uh, the, and, and, and for people who aren't familiar, I mean, Drew, you've done really great work beyond telecom law blog has done really great work providing materials as well for um, just a reminder of how these programs work. But um, the IIJA funds will require matching funds and slurf dollars will be able to provide that match in many situations um, subject to standard non, non double dipping requirements and things like that uh, as in making sure that any network that's built um, has to meet the requirements of of slurf -erf, um, which is 100 100 uh, symmetrical so um, the money is is actually I mean it's very helpful in that areas that have um, a lot of need and not a lot of resources uh, could make sizable investments with a combination of these two programs well, we're going to give everyone a final word, uh, be thinking about best and worst cases from IIJA investments with the lens of community broadband networks. Before we go, I want to remind everyone that we will be back next week with a discussion of artificial intelligence in uh, law, biz, uh, law, media, finance, and government. And then the next week, Groundhog Day, will be broadband mapping. To see more, just go to broadbandbreakfast.com. Uh, BBL slash BBLO. And also just shout out to our sponsors. I've got the link there so you can see and learn more about them. So let's start with Deanne and then Sean, Rye and Chris. Again, what are your best and worst case scenarios for IIJA? Well, I was going to echo what Chris said about constituents and um, being closest to the people that represent them at the local level. And I wholeheartedly believe in that. And I think we, we, um, we too often think that local communities are not paying attention, you know, to these once in a lifetime, you know, 
watershed moments for funding. And they are, you know, um, if, if you have access or you don't, we know just from what we've seen in the news over the last couple of days with covidtest.gov going live, the local communities with and without internet access are paying attention to how dollars are being used and how solutions to end the pandemic are making their way to local communities. So I say we have a lot to learn from this, um, you know, this moment in our life. And I also want to remind people that we're still tossing around the word innovation and that's that's fine. It's innovation era. And a lot of the things that Chris and Ryan and Sean talked about, about communities trying to be innovative and coming up with more than one solution to uh, close the digital divide and work on infrastructure, our local communities, um, you know, it's their plans to be more resilient and to think about how their communities can, uh, you know, scale out and grow bigger and, and recruit people to their towns. And we want to see that. Well, thank you for being with De Deanne. Uh, Sean. Ah, uh, best and worst. Uh, well, the best is that millions of people will be uh, connected. Uh, we'll see uh, um, a lot of new networks being deployed. Um, and I would say um, the worst case scenario from, in, in, from my pers limited perspective is that most of this money will be funneled to just rural regions and not that rural America doesn't need this type of investment. <laughs> But there is um, a misunderstanding out there that the digital divide is sort of between rural America and urban America, and that's not the case. So that would be the worst case scenario. But I, I would just leave with it just a couple of things. Now's the time for communities, states, and localities to be getting their plans together and organizing. Actually, they should have been doing that yesterday, but now is the time. There's, there's, there's a, a windfall of federal investment coming, folks should be thinking about how to best leverage this opportunity. Um, and we should also say that it's, it's, it's going, you know, just to manage expectations a little bit, it's going to take a while. I mean, it's six months before NTIA puts out the rules. States have to put together after that their own plan. So it's probably late 2022, early 2023 before the infrastructure money starts to be distributed. And then there's also, you know, there's, there's a challenge process and so forth. So I, I, I think that best case scenario is that states and communities really get on the ball in terms of organizing plans to best leverage this money in conjunction with the rescue plan funds that are available. Um, and worst case scenario is that it sort of just goes to rural America and many cities that are technically served will get left in the dust and there will be lots of folks that will still have poor connectivity. Thank you for being with us, Sean. Great. Uh, Rai, do you and your cat have anything you want to say in closing? Uh, sure, yes. I'll echo what Sean said and then also say it would be nice in a couple of years to be adding a few dozen more uh, little pinpoints to our community network map. That would make uh, that would make me happier than anything. And then I'll also say that um, the request for comments is out right now, and there are lots of good questions in there about equity and affordability and adoption, um, about local input and accountability. And I think you'll see a lot of local governments and, uh, um, and other uh, locally rooted folks at filing responses that are worth, uh, worth listening to. So it's time to get started on those now. Great, great, wonderful. Chris, we'll give you the last word. Thank you. I, I think the best case scenario is that um, this money spent wisely do, could absolutely make sure that um, every American uh, more or less has um, access at the door. Um, uh, you know, we can talk about um, affordability challenges and digital skills training and things like that, that we need to make sure that everyone is uh, able to make good use of that. And we have a really great down payment on that. Uh, but there's a, there's a whole um, lot of opportunity out there to really resolve some of these challenges. And then we can move on to the next challenges. Um, I think the worst case scenario would be that the rules are too complicated and in cities and states uh, don't take full advantage. And I, you know, I, the cable lobbyists and telephone lobbyists are, I think, really disappointed in the slur for rules. I don't think it's really going to harm them materially in any way, um, but they're going to be pushing very hard on NTIA to make the rules restrictive, to not do all the stuff that Sean talked about. So um, I'm concerned about that. But I mean, I have to say that my faith in, in this administration was significantly restored by how good those Treasury rules were. And I, and I hope that we continue to have that flexibility uh, moving forward. Well, thanks everyone for being with us for a wonderful conversation on behalf of Deanne, Sean, Rye, and Christopher of the Institute for Local Self-Reliances Community Broadband's Network Initiative. I am Drew Clark, Broadband Breakfast. We will see you next Wednesday. 
But also, we'll see you this Friday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time for a big discussion about IIJA. Take care. See you later. Bye-bye.